All right, we're back. Um, thank you while we broke down your patience as we broke down the room. Um, as we'd already done the call to order and the attendance from our workshop, moving right into 3.0 for tonight, are there any adjustments to tonight's agenda? Okay. Seeing none. Um, 4.0, public comment on the agenda items. Again, seeing none. Moving into the superintendent's report. Yeah, so just looking at enrollment, uh, a year ago we were at this time 2,991, and uh, currently in October we're at 2,999. So we're generally up a little bit, and uh, throughout each grade level, you know, you're up three or four kids, or you're down two or three kiddos. So it's it's pretty steady. Um, I think for the most part. <coughs> something that we just want to continue to monitor. Uh, enrollment is really critical to our success and make sure that we're on top of it. And uh, again, if you look at October 18th, uh, 2018 versus October 2019, we are up 51 students overall. So we'll see where we go throughout the rest of the year, but uh, we are growing and uh, that's a good, Good thing, I suppose, but we just want to really make sure we can plan accordingly to the growth. So we're up 51 kids from last year. Okay. I would like to also just mention one other thing. Awesome. That, uh, as you know, we have a vacancy. Joanne Sizemore is going to be retiring, and we'll be talking more about that down the road. But I just wanted the public to know that we have advertised for the assistant superintendent's position, and the application will close on October 16th, and the first round of interviews will be on October 28th, and if we need a second round of interviews, that will be November 7th, and my hope is to come to the school board on December 5th with a recommendation. So I'll keep you posted as we continue on that pathway. Sandy, could, could, uh, could you describe the hiring process for the assistant superintendent? Yeah, so um, what we have going on here is um, Allison and Monique, who are key people in the central office, are co chairing this, and they've put the process together with myself included. Um, and certainly, what we've tried to do is be explicit with the um, larger school community, with staff, and to explain to them what the process is. And that really has gone out already, and we'll continue to keep them informed. And then at the same time, I think the key here is to make sure that we continue to advertise to recruit the best that we can. I'm optimistic. Uh, I was a little worried this time of year, but I can't give you an exact count, but I, I can tell you I think we already pulled in eight to 10 applications, uh, which is really good for this time of year. Mm -hmm. So I'll keep you abreast, and again, we have to be confidential as to a lot of the detail of who applies and stuff like that. But I think Scarborough's going to really attract some really good people, and so I'm really optimistic. And uh, I'm excited. I'm sad also to see mm -hmm. Jimmy leave. I'm jealous. <laughs> you had your chance. <laughs> For 30 days, right? <laughs> Back out, Joe. Right. <laughs> but before we move on from the slide, I just wanted to add one quick thing based on our workshop we just came out of. We were talking about the importance of looking at our best fit uh, enrollment projection model, which is right there in the blue. And for it to be off by four students is that's zero point, if I'm doing my math right, that's 0.13% variance. That's pretty ridiculous. So um, I think we should be very I, I'm kind of flabbergasted that it's that close. Confident. Yes. Yeah, very confident. That's a better word. <laughs> Instead of stunned, confident's a better word. I like that. <laughs> so. Yes, I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. All right. This is a little exciting. School nutrition update. All right. Who's got the clicker? I do. Would you like okay. it? Yeah, give it a shot. Yeah. I could just say that this is uh, Peter Esposito, who uh, 
has a huge job. He's working between Cape Elizabeth and Scarborough. And I think food lunch in the last three or four years has really changed and turned for the best. And I'm so impressed, I, honestly, with Peter's work. And I think you'll see the evidence tonight. He's really uh, got a great team and they do some wonderful things for our students. And I just think back when I was in my school lunch program, I used to take the peas and hide them in the milk carton <laughs> and try to get away with it so I could go out for recess. I and mean, it's just a whole different world today. Absolutely, yes. And much more fresh food, and uh, I thank you for the work that you're doing. You're welcome. Um, so this first slide here, last year I came before you and with my intern Emma, we had created um, a survey at the, um, in the spring, I guess it was, um, and we polled the students on actually what they were looking for, what they wanted, and what we could do better, um, what they, things that they wanted. So we ended up coming out of the program. So what, what we did um, is actually, you'll see, everything, everything that we talked about we've implemented so far. Um, we um, started having some grab-and-go meal offerings, which was, would expedite the service better. So that was for the, the kids that were um, in line too long. So we made it um, easier from some pre-made sandwiches, some pre-made meals that they could microwave or anything. So we did that. Also, we got bagels back, the bagels that an assortment that we were able to serve. Um, we got a new toaster that just came in, so they're going to have two stations, so to expedite that as well, so that they don't have to wait in line so long at breakfast. Um, so one of the other uh, items that was on there was our deli bar. We have a full service deli bar. I don't know if any of you have seen what we have, but it's, you know, I bet you there's 20, 25 items on the bar. Um, so we started adding. Um, there was a huge line and the kids were waiting too long. So we added another person to help expedite that service too without adding any extra labor. It was somebody who was there just chipping in five, 10 minutes at a time to get the students through to just make sure that um, the kids didn't have to wait as long. Um, and then also we still do all scratch cooking. All our sauces, soups, stews, everything is from scratch. We use nothing that's um, out of a can or a jar or anything like that. So that's also one of the things. At, also, it was recommended to have an after-school program. It was something that I wanted to do. So I believe it was Hillary that mentioned that. We do have that now, and we're, we're getting between 50, 60 kids a day, which is also having the prepackaged, uh, microwavable, full meals for kids that have practice. We also have the sandwiches. We also make fresh pizza at the end of the day to make sure these students are not going to Mickey D's or I don't know if I can say that on TV, but, <laughs> but not going and eating something that's unhealthy. We have everything there for them, um, so there's no need for them. Today, when the girl came down with the deposit, she said there were 75 kids today. It was a lot busier. I don't know why. Whatever day, if there's something going on today, there might have been a game, but there was, there was more students today. Um, so one of the other things that we also is, you know, we've, we've created uh, some new recipes. We're always being creative. Um, one of the things we're trying to implement now, which I'll get to um, later on, is about the, the meal service in the lower schools. We've created recipes because all our muffins and stuff are from scratch. So we've had to create it to equal the equivalencies of the grain components and all that. And so these are all developed recipes that we've done in-house ourselves. So this is nothing frozen or anything like that. I just wanted to stress that. Um, so also kids that have to wait, that are on the bus any, any amount of time, they have the, the option to come in, get a snack, get a drink, anything, and then they can get on the bus and, they'll, and they, no need to, you know, for the long bus ride if it's, if it's long for them. So. Oh, I missed that slide, but I already talked about it. So um, one of the other things that I am most very proud of is we launched a culinary program in the school, in-house, at no extra cost. I'm teaching the class. We have a, um, a, another teacher that's working that we've created an outline. It was gone over, and it's actually they're getting credit for it. It was an accredited program. Um, they're getting practical work, hands-on training. They're actually working in the kitchen, but also with instruction from me, and then they're learning all aspects of culinary arts. So it's a two-year program. So I have four students right now, and 
happy to say that all four of those kids have all passed their serve safe certification so at this time any of those four kids could go probably work in any restaurant and they already have a one up on anybody else going in blind so i just wanted to make sure that i got that done first so they can if they wanted to get an after school job or something so um and my goal eventually, because now I'm, they're, we're down at Wentworth with them, is them actually creating the breakfast to serve to the kids is where it's eventually going to work, because we're working on right now breakfast is their section that we're working on. We had a um, uh, scrambled egg section. They were all had to create a recipe and make a breakfast. So they, uh, one student made pancakes, one student made scrambled eggs and cheese, but they also had to make sure that it, it was protein rich and they had all the components that they would if they were going to be serving it to the students. So then after that, they got to sit down. We all ate together, you know, critiqued their food. They all did great. So I'm very proud of them. Very proud of them. That's an actual kid, not the Oh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's actually that's one of our students. That. Um, that student right there has um, actually worked with our, with our baking. They've actually used old school baking scales with the counterweights and all that. We've also trained him on using the gram scale so he can do grams, he can do it by ounces. When he does a recipe, he can, so he can go anywhere and be able to know that and bake or whatever. So he's already got a one up on anybody going in blind. Um, so. Um, one of the things here is, is basically the, the financials that we've had. And basically, if you look at that, the breakdown, we've, we are up about over $10,000 in sales for this time last year. So we started this year, like I had told you, we were going to have a few weeks. We weren't going to have everything implemented at the end of the year. Well, this is the slowest month usually is, is September. I have more expenses and all that, but I'm already up over $10,000 so far, just one year to date. Sorry, can you go back? No. I was just wondering, I just wanted to, that's just the high school? That's just the high school. That's just the high school. Is that, um, is that profit? Is that, that's, that's, no, that's the that's revenue. revenue. That's okay. the okay. revenue. Because you were saying you had extra costs, so I didn't know if the, were the extra costs related? No, I had no extra costs. Oh, you had no extra no, costs. I zero, thought you said you had extra zero. costs. So okay. Basically, my culinary program is running through us, and I'm free. Basically, okay. I'm the free instructor. So we're doing that as part of our program gotcha. to give these kids a one-up. Thank this you. This is just raw sales figures. Right. Gotcha. And also, we had got, you see the vending machine. Uh, we have a POS vending machine, so they can use their, their accounts. Also, we have yogurts milks, all that stuff in the vending machine. So even if where our cafeteria is not open, that is also available for students to get snacks. So I, I'm happy that we're up that much for a month. We already paid off the vending machine. So the vending machine paid for itself well before the time that we thought it would. One of the other things that we did last year is we wanted to reduce our carbon footprint. We worked with Dylan Hinton, um, and I purchased silverware for the whole district. Um, we stopped using plastic altogether. Um, we wanted to reduce our carbon footprint, and we really are stressing the recycling and composting part. Uh, Dylan and I met with classes at Wentworth. Um, they met, we met with a bunch of different groups. They trained. We worked together collaboratively with the other, the other schools, and um, we're, we're all silverware now. There's no plasticware in any of the schools. So I am also proud of that. Um, Excuse me, quick question. Sorry. So we Except, have, yeah. yeah, in the well, high school, what's yeah. the chance of that coming back? Well, we had, a, we had an issue with kids mm -hmm. making statues out of the silverware and all that, yeah. and it got to the point where we had purchased about half of what we had lost, about half of what we purchased, mm -hmm. was, which was over 500 pieces. Mm -hmm. um, we met with uh, actually Sue Catch. Um, and she made announcements, other people made announcements, so that's one thing that we're looking to bring back in. But all the other schools are all, are all silverware. And I guess 
I expected it to be the other way, that the little kids would be doing that, but, but we're going to try it again because we do have the trays and all that, and we're yeah. trying to get rid of all paper, everything. Yeah, but it's going gonna, gonna to take a little bit of time. Yeah, that was awesome. Though. Because also, we're not asking for any extra money. We're buying all of this stuff in what we already have budgeted without having a separate budget line for all of these items. So this is something that we're just incurring the cost ourselves and not asking for any extra money to do. Um, also, we still do the farm to school. We use Maine Family Farms for some of our, some of our meats. We, um, we purchase locally from the farm in Cape Elizabeth. We do our apples, pears, uh, peaches. We get from brackets that's up by my house um, in York County in Lymington. So we, we still are doing that. We have that relationship with him for now five years since I've been here. So that's, an, that's another thing. And when we do our harvest lunch, that's another thing where we'll get some from some other farms that have maybe just have squash or something that we'll, we'll bring them in too. I try to go and see where I can get what from. Um, one of the things that we've We've uh, seen with the, the lunch pattern that we have to follow is a lot of kids, we, were, we, we had to make them take a certain item. They have to have, and that's another thing I'll get into. For breakfast, they have to have three items that have on their tray to be counted as a reimbursable meal. Well, in, at lunch, they have to have three of five. On breakfast, it's you know three of whatever we put out, but one of those has to be a fruit, and it can't be juiced more than one or two times a week. So. Um, what we've done with theirs, we, when we tell the, the child that they need to take that, and sometimes they don't, they don't want it or whatever, we have a share cut for anybody that needs a snack after school or whatever, we'll put that in the basket. If it's an apple or something like that, we'll go in and wash them and put them out, and then they take them and they'll use them for snacks. So we don't, we don't want to waste that stuff, but we also want to make sure that it's available to anybody that needs a snack. Um, our backpack program, we've added more families. Tomorrow I have to deliver 10 to, because we do it weekly for the 10 families. And then um, on when there's long weekends or vacations, we have about 30 that we're, we're bringing. So we're actually, we have expanded our pantry and we're looking into even changing it even more to having it be more like a regular pantry where they come in and pick their groceries as opposed to us putting up certain things. And we got a generous donation again this year, and um, we're gonna we're gonna purchase the stuff and let them come in and maybe do their own shopping. Um, community Thanksgiving dinner. Um, what, how many years is this? Four. Fourth or fourth year. So this is the fourth year. It's getting really easy to do. So we uh, we serve you know roughly 400 people uh, for free Thanksgiving dinner. The it's easy. Um, well, it, it gets easier as it goes, the planning and stuff. It's kind of like old hat now, so everybody knows their, their things that they need to do. We'll have a meeting um, and tidy this up and be ready to go again. Hopefully we'll get more. We had, uh, we had expanded it to offer in the surrounding areas, and I said roughly we had about, I don't know, 400 people last year we served. Um, it's, a, it's a great thing if anybody's not seen it. Um, people come from everywhere, sit together, strangers that don't know, have break bread together. I mean, basically is what it is. It's a great community thing, and it's great that Scarborough um, supports this. And a reminder that it's not like a free meal for someone. No, it, you know, we, yeah, it's not just, it's not just for food insecure. It's for everybody, and it's more so there's people, older folks that maybe don't have family around, or maybe people that just live here, that their family somewhere else, and they couldn't make it out. So it's a way for them to come together and have a meal, and you know, not have to worry about going out to dinner or something. And there's a crowd of people, so it's it's a really good atmosphere. Um, I am always trying to save money. <laughs> so one of the things we're part of the uh, York Cumberland Co-op. I am the president-elect of that group. Um, we, we do a lot of things other than just food pricing. We handle a lot of training. This year we just had um, uh, a multi-district training. Actually, our, our co-op is the biggest in the state. We're, we're about uh, six million in groceries, but with dairy and all that stuff, it's well over 10, 11 million dollars in sales. So we uh, are able to keep our prices competitive and, um, and with the more school districts. And actually, it was easier this year to do all our all staff training, which we have to do anyways. We're mandated. We did it as a group, and we all went to Westbrook 
uh, middle school and we had 500 people in a room and we had the state come down and we did all the training right there. So that was a really good thing. Also, the media attention that Kate slipped in there was an article that was about when I had taken Kate. I had taken Cape out of there last year and roughly, um, I think one of the things in the article is we had made in a month, it was about a $12,000 increase in sales because of that. But not only did it increase in a la carte sales, our meal sales were, were up as well. So what we did there is we created the college-like atmosphere. We had self-service on certain things, um, and the kids really, really enjoyed it, and it shows in the numbers that we have. So I don't know if all of you have heard of the new food shaming bill. Well, one of the things is we cannot discuss um, a child's balance with the child. We can't say you need to bring in money. We can't say anything like that. We cannot discuss anything with that. But also, um, which becomes a problem with some of this is like the fruit and stuff at the end of the end of the thing. As I talked about, they have to have the three components for breakfast, same for lunch, and we have to make sure that they adhere to that. If they don't, then we have to ch charge it a la carte. Um, the reason is. Um, the state actually we were audited last year and they actually stand behind the register and they want to make sure that you're giving exact, absolutely what you're supposed to so for reimbursement purposes. If we don't adhere to this, then we could be fined and made to pay back reimbursement. So that is the reason why that is like that. Can, can you repeat that? The, the, if a student who has a reimbursable meal doesn't take the, the required they have to have the required then amount, they are charged for they are charged a la carte. Part. Yeah. So who's responsible? The parents are responsible for paying the a la carte piece? Yeah. Is yep. Can I ask a, a follow-up question sure. to that? Sure. Um, that, that seems counterintuitive to, like, they're, they're on free and reduced lunch and... Well, and no, it's just talking about free and reduced. We're talking about any, any reimbursable meal because if we right. have a paid kid that has a reimbursable meal, he, we also will get subsidy for that child. No, I, I understand that, but like it, it, if it's if it's a situation um, with a free and reduced lunch, and they're they're being charged because they don't take the three items, yep. is there a way that we can avoid doing that by just asking them to take the items we and do. teaching them about the we the do, share and card? we've actually done tours when they come in, like into the schools in the, in the Wentworth and in the little schools, they're actually given a tour and they're told exactly what they can, can and cannot get. Like, especially in the middle school and high school levels, they know that the a la carte, but the littler kids, there's not really any a la carte except for spring water, mm -hmm. but they are told, we have signs everywhere, and I should have brought one of the signs that says, you need to take this. This big signs everywhere, it says you have to take this, and a half a cup of fruit has to be on the tray. It doesn't matter. That's one thing for lunch they have to have on there. Mm -hmm. so, so practically, so I, I, I'm just trying to understand that because we've gotten some feedback on, yep. on this issue. Is there a way to turn off a la carte for kids that? The, yes, and, that, and that's, un, well, going ahead. That's one of the things we have. The software that I purchased when I came here, um, we, one of the things, I'll start from here, it's integrated with PowerSchool, so that's one thing. So there's never, there's never any, any data that a kid will see whether they're free, reduced, or paid. They, they have no idea what it is. We also have an online application for free and reduced, so there's no paper that ever has to change hands because we, we wanted to make sure that we're, they're completely autonomous from anybody having to touch anything. Um, we do have paper ones that they can send in, but on our software, when they set up a payment account, they can set up spending limits. They can also, they can also block a la carte. They can look and see every transaction that they made, and they can set up notifications for themselves when their balance is low. So that, that is all something that's in the software, and we, we went over and we posted that to the website, so all of that instructions are on there, and it has been. Is there a way to get that? sent home to parents sort of in the weekly announcements? It's, it's, it's right on the, there's a link to the website that has all of that on there. On, you, on where? On the stu school website. But they on would have district. to, so I'm just thinking if I'm a parent who yeah. has a, 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 it, my particular concern is, although I've heard concerns about kids buying their friends breakfasts and maybe in my house that's happened a few times. And, <laughs> uh, um, but I'm really particularly concerned about the kids with free and reduced mm -hmm. and then accruing a, a, 
um, a la carte bill and the parents right. are, are sort of unknowing. They would have to know to seek out the website, right, in order to shut that no, off. We sent everything home when we started this, and when we do when we do open houses and stuff. All this information is available. So you sent home at the. That we didn't send it home, but there was a link, and we also made sure that they knew that this was available. Because when we did implement it, we did send home a whole email blast that went out. Could we include something in our upcoming newsletter? Just a like maybe a small reminder about this? We've it's got already. links at the end of this presentation to all of those things, so it would be really easy to just pick those. Yeah, so we set great. it up so they could actually go on here, and then they can see it, and then we have links so that they can go in and do anything. That includes the instructions, too. We've just Thank gotten you. some feedback that people are, are unaware of that, parents are unaware of that, and so, you know, okay. you get 100 yeah. things back in and, the beginning of the year. It would have been great to get a phone call for that, and I would have explained all of it to them exactly, and right. I would have showed them how to right. go in and do this step by step. And of course, if anybody wanted to come into my office, I'll sit down with them and set it up for them. Yeah. Thank Same you. here. And Kate can, too. She's, she's pretty good at it now. I'm not scared of you, but I can do it. I think that would be great for a couple of reasons. Um, first, not everybody is as savvy as we all might be in terms of um, maneuvering through so a website. So all they have to do is ask, yeah. Right, and, yeah. Um, but, well, and I think also, uh, I think we forget that not everybody has internet access in their homes. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we need to really be, be mindful of that. And I know the information is available, um, but I think that we just need to be um, mindful of the fact that it might not be accessible for everybody in the district. Right, okay. Yes, you can use your smartphone as well. You can use it on your phone, you can do an app, and also there's another thing that I put in here, the new software that we bought for our menu, menuing also has all the nutrient facts on there, so we wanted to make sure that we were totally, um, everybody could get their calories, their carb counts, their fat, everything, and every recipe that we have that we serve for lunch, you can click on it and it'll tell you exactly what, what that is. But if there is really is somebody that actually needs and doesn't have internet access, just yeah. have, send them in to me or, or or to Kate, and we'll we'll set them up. Awesome. Thank it you. won't it won't take so long. We have, we have scheduled space in our newsletter for a nutrition update, so I think it'd be really easy for us to just say at the bottom, um, here's where you can go to find more information, and if you have trouble, please. Don't hesitate yep. to and, and, and if they if they were looking at menus on the school the um, school department website, they would see all that information if they had internet access. Leanne, can we get that last paragraph with the link and the uh, specifically the spending limits and the a la carte? Can that go home in like the phase levels too, like mm -hmm. to all the Wentworth parents and and just make sure that they are getting that blast, maybe even, you know, maybe if they've had it at the beginning, they just need some multiple reminders. Yeah. In a phone call, too, you know, most people have phones, so if they want to call, I can walk them through it, too, if they don't want to come in, if they can't make it in. Thank you. Another, um, just to add to what Alicia's saying, I, I feel like when you go on the website, I know it's so obvious that there's a there's a section for nutrition, but when I think about getting information on school lunches, I automatically go down to parent information. Like there's a section on parent information. So I'm just wondering if that could be like double linked. Like it, I'm not, I, I know what you mean. No, are you, are you, you talking, about, yeah. are you so talking like about on the menu itself? No. no. So okay. if you go on to just our district website, there's like a um, there's a banner down yeah. the side and it gives you all these different places that you can go. Um, and there's a whole section on parent information. And so I can, even though I've been a parent for like nine years now, and I know that the lunch menu is under the nutrition section, I always go to the parent information Maybe first. You should put it there then yeah. too. So I'm wondering if it could just be duplicated in those two places. That's a great idea, a great idea. And the menu too, if it's yeah. easy to do, you put can, the menu there as well. You can actually do a link we can actually create the link to the menu from there if you mm -hmm. want to. So yeah, that would be, that, be And great. we'll have it in more than one place. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Even if you just have a link that's on the parent information that says all your school nutrition info is here and then it mm -hmm. takes you back to the other sites, you're not double posting. 
Sure. Mm -hmm. And with this, with all these changes, it would be really easy for us to come up with some meme or, you know, something to post on Facebook, just redirecting people to the website, too. But this is, it's easy to close the circle on this, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so much great information that is available, just making sure that people are using yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, um, so on this slide here, we, uh, we send out automated emails weekly, also for account balances, minus $5 usually. Um, some of that, um, I, I guess, has gone to spam and other times, and we think we've got that all taken care of, but um, they are generated weekly, and also that is from my office, and also if they are signed up on the payment portal and you set your parameters and you set notifications, it'll automatically notify you when your balance is low. That would be any time instead of weekly. That would be an instant notification. Can I ask a quick I know we got you through the um, food shaming bill. Yeah. We kind of moved you faster through that. Um, offhand, and I'm sure I can go back and look at it as well, are there any policies that need to be updated to support this so that you're covered with a food shaming bill? Is it part of wellness? Mm -hmm. I, think, I think. I think we did put it in wellness. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure that we were covered there. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that part is in there. It might have been added after. <laughs> no, actually, <laughs> I'll double check. I say it's up for a second reading tonight, isn't it? Yep. So then again, I had talked about the menu software that we implemented that you can get all the nutritional information. Um, so if um, the reason, one of the reasons that we did that is we have a lot of, you know, kids that may be diabetic or something like that or um, on special diets. That way there they can, the nurses can check the carb counts for the whole menu instead of, you know, having somebody and taking five minutes to go piece together a bunch of stuff. This is instantaneous and they can get it immediately. So there's no, there's no lag time in that. It's immediate and it's usually done a month ahead of time. Um, and here's, here's some links to the portal. Um, this, this probably would be a good one to send out. Um, which has a parent's guide, um, it has the DOE nutrition website that you can go on if there's any guidance that you want to look at. Um, we do, did make copies of the 58 page meal um, pattern requirements that we have to do. Um, if anybody wants to sit and go over that with me, I'd be happy to, happy to do that. Um, and if anybody had any questions. Um, and then if there's any other questions or anybody has, they can contact Kate or myself and we'll, we'll help them with anything through, so. Yes, yes ma'am. Um, you mentioned when you were talking about the really cool course that the kids are taking. Yeah. You mentioned um, that it's an accredited program and yeah. I was just wondering what the name of that was. Culinary One right now. Culinary One. And yeah. it's accredited through? Well, actually we created an outline. We have Scott McDonald that actually is what is I don't know what his official title is. He's a Trish. So he does with the Vogue and stuff like that. Yeah. So he, we created this outline. He made sure that the content was there, what we needed. I believe Monique went and looked at the whole the whole curriculum part of it. Yeah. And so they'll actually so you're, get you're credit. You're saying that students are going to receive course credit from Scarborough High School? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And through and it, so you guys worked with the Vogue, the, Vogue, the local Vogue program to do that or no. the internal? We do it right yeah. here. So the, the students don't have to leave the campus. Right. Yeah. That's so cool. So we have some extra space at Wentworth too, so they're down there um, doing breakfast. Is four the maximum number of students that you can carry um, right now? I, I think I might be, they're gonna kill me, but I think <laughs> I could fit a few more. Um, but I mean, this is all in hopes that this thing goes bigger and we end up having a program because there's no home ec in school anymore and they need something like this to be in the building. So um, not even if they're going into the culinary arts. Um, if someone just wants to learn how to cook and make a meal for themselves, I mean, these students here, um, like I said, they're gonna have one up on other kids that go out to look for a job. And my goal is to, with my contacts in the area, to get them placed in jobs if they wanna choose to continue that. So that's what we're working towards. Thank you. I was just wondering, um, I was, I'm really happy to see that the after school availability for snacks is working out mm -hmm. and that so many kids are using it. Um, and I was just wondering, my kid is using it and she loves it. Um, I was just wondering, there's a lot of student athletes and kids who stay after for clubs at the middle school too. And 
does the fact that they're still a part of the federal nutrition program preclude them from being able to have yeah. those after school snacks? I mean, snacks? they could have after school <laughs> snacks. I mean, we, we could do something like that if that's something. But um, we tried at one point, to, and there wasn't a, a huge, huge following for that. I mean, that's something that I'd be certainly open to try again. To, to do if there's if there's the need for it there, but I just I wanted to try at the high school because I figured you know the kids and you had asked, um, and we seem to be hitting it off pretty well there. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really appreciate Thank it. You. Chairs report. Um, the beginning of the school year is a great time to talk about communication, and one of the pieces that we really want to emphasize, or I'd like to emphasize, um, is who communicates what. Um, the board's responsibility is communicating new policies, our budget rollout, district leadership changes. How we do so is through social media, through our websites, and through Swift Reach. The district. They're going to be communicating things such as new procedures, late start dates, the bus routes, overall bus routes. Again, through the same sorts of processes. Um, social media, the website, Swift Reach, newsletters. And the schools, specifically, are communicating things such as open houses, building events, grade-specific news. Also on the same social media sites, newsletters, flyers, and Swift Reach. And we have great graphic. Um, again, showing how this communication goes out. Um, in addition, with the board, we're making sure that our meeting notices are up. We're talking about whether it's committee or board level. Um, the agenda is, again, budget information, making sure that that's getting there, all district-wide information. Um, it's really just making sure that folks know where to find the information. Um, we've done a really good job of keeping things at the same pages so you, someone doesn't have to go looking for the board specific to find out when the board meeting is. You go to the district website or page and you're seeing all that information. Um, for the buildings, parent teacher dates, open houses, their news, it should all be at that local level and that's where folks should be looking for that information. Um, student activities, again, keeping it all down to that local level. Um, I know there's been a lot of conversation and a lot of feedback that we've received about how the communi communication is getting out there and really just making sure that we have that clear delineation that we ensure the district is being run well and we've got great people in place who are running it in a great manner. We don't need to get down into that level and shouldn't be down in that level. So just touching on that. And as Sandy mentioned, um, I've tried to pretend that it's not going to happen, um, but it is. Joanne has, um, is going to be retiring. She has a few things I think you are going to share. Um, and we just wanted to make that announcement now that she's had an opportunity to tell folks herself first. OK, thank you. This was a very hard decision, and I hope I can. So I just want to say that I've had a wonderful career here in Sparrow. I started off as a math teacher at the junior high and then became principal with an opportunity to build a school, uh, middle school with a philosophy. In the last 10 years, I have been at central office. Throughout my career, I have worked with great educators, students, and parents. All have taught me a lot. Have to admit that middle school students will always have a special place in my heart. They do keep you young fashion, music, activities. Since leaving the middle school, I have not had an exciting April Fool's. <laughs> I just want you to know I will miss all of you, and thank you again for a wonderful career here in Scarborough. It, it's not going to be the same. Um, and I know we haven't given the date, but your last day will be the 31st of December. Um, Joanne has promised to come back in the spring so that we can 
acknowledge yeah. everything that she has done um, for us um, over an incredible career. Show me a thank you for all that you have done um, for us as a board, for me personally, and learning how to navigate in this position. Um, you have been invaluable. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And um, I just wanted to go. And um, <laughs> budget season started again. <laughs> But um, I do want to come back when you do recognize people and have it done with everybody in the district and, and be included that way. But, um, it has been a fabulous career, and I just think it was the right time for me now to kind of go to do something else. Be on the beach. Be on the beach. <laughs> Joe, I just, I just want to thank you for the support that you have given this board and me personally. It's been a phenomenal experience for me to work with you. I've learned so much from you. You are a classy lady and an amazing educator, and I just can't say more how much I appreciate you. So thank you. I too, uh, the good thing with Joanne and myself, I've worked with her outside of being in this position over the years, and I've worked with her through the University of Southern Maine. She's been very, instrumental in teaching courses there, being a leader, demonstrating what good leadership's about, um, her work with the Sebago Ed Alliance, mm -hmm. she's been very connected to that, and certainly the vocational schools on a monthly basis, uh, Joanne has been involved representing Scarborough, so outside of here, I just feel like I've really seen her as a true leader in Southern Maine, and uh, she's taught us a lot, and I it's so well deserved. Mm -hmm. While you're healthy and ready to go, I hope so. <laughs> I, know you'll, I know you'll do well. So thank, thank you, you for Sandy. That you've done here, as well as the greater Southern Maine uh, organizations that you've been involved in. Thank you. Just to lighten the mood a little bit. Um, yeah. <laughs> just <laughs> want to give a big congratulations to Jarrett Flaker. I know we hear his name a lot. Um, but he was named Class A Star of the Week for Week 3 in football. Not that it's always all about sports, um, but given the size of Class A and the number of amazing athletes, what an incredible accomplishment for one of our students. Okay, committee reports. Starting with communication. Um, so communications met um, earlier this week. And uh, we chose a Spotlight Award winner um, who will be announced and celebrated at our next meeting, October 17th. Did I get that date right? Mm -hmm. okay. um, also, uh, as we just talked about, the fall issue of the district-wide newsletter is going to come out um, late October. Um, and like as we said, they'll have some information about some of the newer things that are happening um, in the district and just some overall information. We'll add the nutrition um, piece into that. Um, and then the last thing that I just wanted to touch on quickly, um, because it, it relates directly to what you were talking about in your chair report, Leanne, is um, the changing access for um, some of the social media accounts that we have. Um, for whatever reason, uh, there was a big piece missing um, in the access that we gave. So, so we're always trying to balance um, who has how many people have access versus what the information is we want to get out. Um, and so in an effort to do that, I think uh, the building um, level access was left out inadvertently, I'm sure. So um, what we need to do is reassess that. We're going to gather a group together that had met um, throughout last year, have them re, re um, meet again and um, go over how we want to change some of that access. Um, like the bubbles that Leanne had showed, shown you before was specific to social media. Um, and right now, um, like some, some people in the district have some access to some, some um, social media accounts and not others. Um, no building principals or building level administrators have any access, which is the big piece that's missing right now. Um, uh, Monique and some of the instructional coaches have different levels of access some some have them to you know instagram and not facebook or
Twitter and Instagram, and, but not, I don't know. Um, and, and those are the people who are responsible for posting those like really granular day-to-day -day things that are happening. Um, and then of course the district, like Kelly has access um, to some of it. I have access to some of it. Um, so that, uh, those are the people who are responsible for um, posting about some of the uh, larger top level district-wide type announcements. Um, but what we are missing and have been missing is somebody who's posting, whether it's the administrators or somebody that they designate, um, school school activities. So we are reassessing that, and um, once that that committee meets again, um, those three bubbles of people, like the, the district level, the building level, and the, the student level, those, um, those representatives are going to go back to their respective groups talk about what is what is what are the expectations for posting and who should do it and then after that happens we'll all come back together and hopefully that will be um, the the meeting for that is October 15th and hopefully they'll be able to go back down talk to their people and we'll be able to come back up and have it straightened out so that um, we have equitable access to our social media without overdoing the access so I don't know if um, anyone has any questions about that anyone is welcome to come to that October 15th meeting if you have a special interest in that um, yeah that's it and our next um, communications meeting for for the board communications committee is October 21st thank you finance uh, I am actually gonna April is gonna do this update because I was not the last joint finance meeting uh, but I will say everyone has in front of them the copy of Kate printed out like a good Samaritan that she is, um, sort of an overview of what the field was covered in the meeting. So you have that sort of built in. Okay. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, I had the pleasure of uh, representing us uh, at the Joint Finance Committee meeting, which took place um, last week. Um, the document that you have in front of you is, is what I presented um, to the Joint Finance Committee. It was developed by the our um, board finance committee. And essentially the first page is just an outline of our budget process to make sure that town council understands our process and that we just keep reiterating, um, you know, and making sure that they are on board and understand the steps that we go through to build our budget. Um, the second page is a spreadsheet that we developed um, to um, essentially create a projection um, of our net budget um, need for next year's budget, so FY21. Um, and what we did was we ran uh, the geometric mean <laughs> of, the five, of the last five years. I got a lot of um, ribbing for repeatedly saying the words geometric mean at joint finance and I was going to try not to say it but I don't know how else to explain this <laughs> um, so essentially what we did was we took uh, the year over year change that we have experienced from 2015 leading up to 2020 um, to develop what we think is going to be our projected net budget need for FY21 um, and so we presented that budget change, which um, the average is 5.61. Um, and essentially, we kind of just delivered this number to um, the Joint Finance Committee and gave them, with the understanding that they would process um, what we were presenting and that they would you know, take um, some more time to think about our process and make sure that they agree with our projection and the way we came about those numbers. Um, it, we've tried to make it as collaborative as possible, so if they have feedback or other suggestions for ways that we can arrive at a more accurate um, project, uh, projection, then we're certainly open to that. Um, but for right now, everyone at the table seemed happy with this projection. Uh, we also discussed the need for a potential, uh, for lack of a better word, fudge factor um, to accommodate things that we cannot um, necessarily easily predict, like our increase in required services. Um, there's no good way, if you look back over the last five years, there's no good way to predict um, what our um, net change is gonna be. Um, and so we 
all we can do is is put out the facts to the joint committee um, and make sure that town council understands there are always going to be things that we don't know as we build our budget um, and that we are being transparent and that we are coming up with ways to do projections but that's that the, we are limited and and um, so Overall, I feel like the meeting went really well. Um, one of the big takeaways from the meeting was that town council, um, the town council finance committee uh, agreed that they need to send representation from the town council to our two-day budget discussion, which happens in April, um, Mar Mar March. I think it's, it's the first week in April. The first week in April, okay. And it, it might be on March 31st. Right. Like that, yeah. Just prior to first reading. <laughs> Um, and so that's great that they've already um, committed to that um, because we all find it so valuable and in order for them to really understand our budget and what we're asking for, um, it's great to have them um, send a representative to, to, take, that, to take that deep dive. Um, let's see. Our next joint finance committee meeting will be on October 23rd. The purpose of that meeting will be to finalize um, our overall goals. By the sounds of it, town council is still discussing whether or not they um, are going to set two goals, which would be a net budget goal and a mill rate increase goal. Um, but we would kind of be separate from that mill rate increase goal in the sense that we actually have an attainable target this year, which is a change from the past. Because as I've tried to explain um, in the past, when the town council sets a 3% mill rate goal, mm -hmm. that is not something that the school board can actively work towards because we're only a small piece of that equation. Mm -hmm. um, and so hopefully all of these you know, incremental changes to the conversation will result in a budget process that goes a little more smoothly. And if nothing else, um, we've certainly communicated our side to the joint committee. Um, and so one thing that we tabled because Sarah was not there and Peter was not there was a discussion around um, whether we should be trying to hit the goal at first reading or second reading. And so uh, we will be discussing that at the next joint meeting on the 23rd, which will be a lively discussion, I'm sure. Yes, and that date might actually change because okay. I know that you and Leanne uh, can't be there can't that go. night. So okay. I've talked to Peter about possibly changing, or uh, Don, about changing that. So date TBD maybe. Yes. And uh, we'll get this posted on the website. Great. Thanks, Amber. All right. Long range planning and building steering. Yes. Yeah, so I added a slash to this because I wanted to, I, I felt like if I left building steering out, I was missing a big piece of the puzzle, which is a lot of the long range planning update these days. Um, so I just kind of wanted to go through a brief outline of what's gone down and recently some of this we've talked about before, but um, at the last meeting we talked about um, putting an application out. We're in the process of putting out basically uh, an official way for people to express interest in participating in our building steering committee um, focused on the primary schools. We had over 50 people express interest through that form, um, which was a wonderful turnout. Um, in addition to that, we had our principals from the K-2 schools actually give us some recommendations of folks, so we reached out to those people and strongly encouraged them to apply. Um, we, didn't wanna, we didn't want them to feel like they were voluntold to do this, so we did want to make sure that they uh, had the opportunity to apply, and, and, but knew that the principals had uh, nominated them, so we reached out to those individuals. Um, we had a very strong participation last night in a community conversation meeting that we had on this subject uh, designed to uh, expose them more to the some of the details of the project and some of the things that brought us to this point but also gave them the opportunity to meet Paul Cazell who was the chair of the Wentworth Building Committee um, steering committee and the building committee uh, as that was formed as I understand it um, and he spoke very eloquently about the advantages and some of the challenges of this type of work but he described it and I'm going to paraphrase this as one of the most rewarding in fact the most rewarding volunteer effort he's ever been involved in which I thought was inspirational and um, I'm really glad he took the time to share that kind of uh, personal aspect of the reward with the room um, we had exit slips that we asked people to uh, prepare for us if they had any additional questions or anything they wanted to say, specifically asking them if after you heard all this, do you still want to do this? Um, so we made sure that they uh, continued to express their interest. Um, I was also very thankful for Paul's talk um, for two specific reasons. One, he talked about um, 
how this is such a large process and that this steering committee that we're going to talk about later tonight and the, um, we're going to have a motion about it and then we're going to have an executive session about it. Um, we're going to be selecting six community members um, to serve on this steering committee, but it's the very surface layer of the onion. There's going to be so many ways to be involved in this process if we follow the model that the Wentworth process uh, did. And Wentworth is still, I think, known as one of the largest, most community-driven um, school building projects in state recent history. Uh, and so I think if we want to follow that, which I can't see any reason why we wouldn't, um, everybody that was in that room last night is going to have the opportunity to be involved. And so we made sure that people knew that, you know, because people have asked us, you know, well, what if I don't get chosen? And I wasn't trying to be cold when I said this, but I'm a math teacher, so I said there's over 54 of you that have expressed interest in only six seats, so the odds are you won't be chosen. But, but that doesn't mean that you won't be involved in this process. Every single person that wants to be involved in the process of this new school, whatever that school turns out to be, will have an opportunity to be involved. And in fact, the, the, the information that we've gathered through this form and what I let people know last night, we're going to keep this list, this list of kind of uh, fish in a barrel, if you will, of people that have, have very uh, broad skills and sets of um, expertise so that as the formal building committee comes around, uh, which will have a much larger membership, we'll have members of our town council involved in that, we'll have members of our local law enforcement involved in that, we'll have the transportation people involved in that. Um, the steering committee is a small group to help us, as we talked about at our last meeting, um, set and solidify the charge for what we're going to do. But the building committee that comes after is a much larger and much um, more dynamic and, and wide-scale group. And so I did want to get that out there just so folks know that um, it's not like in a few months the, we're going to know all the answers about this school. We're going to know that what size the windows are going to be and what color the countertops are going to be. All of those design and all of those really important discussions come in the months and years that follow the work that the steering committee is going to do. Um, so I, I guess I'll just sum it up by saying I'm just so thrilled by the community interest in this and by the wide scale of uh, expertise and time and dedication that people are pledging to put into this project. I think it paints a very positive direction for this type of very important but also very tiring work. Uh, and so it says a lot about this town that people are excited at getting involved at this point. And so I, I couldn't be more thrilled with how far we've come in the last couple months and moving toward um, having a steering committee uh, that can get this charge on the books. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Negotiations. Yeah, sure. Um, just, a, just a quick update to inform folks that we are currently working with a mediator to help us um, get a settlement. And um, as is the case with all negotiations, um, it still remains a confidential process, so I can't share any more details at this time. Okay. Thank you. I like your slide, though. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Policy. Currently, we're working on the reporting child abuse, abuse and neglect policy JLF, uh, incorporating, incorporating recent updates to the law. Uh, moving forward, we'll also be focusing on updating the policies affected by changes to the laws from the last legislative session, uh, to which I believe the number was 124 new legislations that impact the schools. Um, so there's a lot of work ahead of us. Um, We'll be prioritizing those in comparison to the list that has been um, ongoing in our backlog and be working towards how to incorporate as many of those as possible um, in the upcoming year. Uh, our next meeting is next Wednesday at 4.30 in Central Office. Liaisons, health and uh, safety. Okay, so um, we met in September uh, chaired by Joanne, uh, we got an update uh, that over the summer uh, there was an active shooter drill that was held that um, was coordinated between police, fire, and the schools. 85 people attended, and um, they received feedback from 65 of those attendees. Uh, they also have a post-exercise improvement program grant, so they're able to really look at the exercise and, and make determinations of things that were successful and things that they need to um, 
uh, make some changes on. Last year they had tabletop exercises at the school that included school um, staff and public safety and, and it was really uh, highlighted by administration that um, the front end uh, of, of uh, support staff really needs to feel comfortable to make calls if they feel uncomfortable and that those tabletop exercises were really helpful in, in, in improving their comfort level. So um, I think that that's something that they're talking about um, on, a, on a continuing basis. Uh, Officer Pellerin was in attendance. He talked about um, a rave panic button, which is similar to Share 911. If you're unfamiliar with it, it's an app. Uh, that would allow for just a press of a button to access not only 911 but also um, uh, on site individuals and, and off site individuals if there is a, an emergency at the school. And um, it's supposed to improve communication and, and response time. That uh, is $1,800 a year per campus, and it looks like uh, the cost for us would be $7,200 a year with unlimited users, that's a mobile-based app. So that's something that I hope um, he continues to look into uh, because, you know, it's, safety is the, the most important thing we can do for our school. So um, there's also a, a wellness subcommittee. Um, Kate has been working with her team to um, update the, the wellness uh, policy as we've talked about previously and to become um, or ensure compliance with federally. So that's um, been something that they've worked really hard on. There was an end of the year speaker that we heard about previously, Dr. Brooks, who um, came for pers uh, professional development and um, talked um, about uh, promoting social and emotional learning and that's been implemented in, in the various phase levels. Thank you. Town Council? Uh, Quick town council update, just a reminder that we have an uh, election upcoming. Uh, the election date is November 5th and voting will take place uh, at the high school from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, additionally, town council has uh, officially formed a uh, community center committee. Uh, we have two representatives from the school board on that committee and they've met twice. Um, and so I'm sure once they begin to meet and um, establish their norms and, and form committees that those guys will be able to give us a better update on what the community center is, um, how that's progressing. Um, the vocational schools are off to a great start. We had our first meeting two weeks ago. Um, both Paths and Westbrook Voc um, saw increases in enrollment for this year. And I apologize, I had meant to um, bring our school specific um, enrollment numbers so that I could share those with you. Um, but I'm happy to do that in a future update just so that you guys have an idea of how many students we send to each program. Um, uh, I think that's all. Okay. Um, can you guys sit down? Moving into uh, 8.0, student representative reports. All right, so to start, um, so this past week, the last week was um, Spirit Week at the high school, and we had our homecoming dance, um, pep rally, and the homecoming football game all in this last week, so it's a busy week. Um, for Spirit Week, we that's the week before the pep rally, so Monday was color by grade. Um, freshmen were orange, sophomores were purple, juniors were yellow, and seniors were pink. Um, Tuesday is USA Day, Wednesday is Wacky Wednesday, Thursday is Taurus Day, and Friday is Storm Day, so I included some pictures, some students with their spirit on. <laughs> and these are some photos from the pep rally. Um, students participated in events like a munchkin toss, tug of war, a spirit stick challenge, and many more. It was a really fun event for everyone. As you can see, all the classes make their own banners, and. They typically will wear shirts that spell out the name of their class. And these are some pictures from the homecoming dance, which was last Saturday. We had Ben Hatch, who is a senior at Scarborough High School. He was the DJ, and then Jacob Lewis took all these pictures. 
Um, in the past couple, well this past month since school started, advisories have been doing little um, fun challenges and activities to get to know each other and themselves. So this was one that I thought I wanted to include that all the advisories did um, on Fridays. It was called Who Am I? And you just got to fill out little boxes. Um, you get to draw a self-portrait in the top <laughs> left corner of that big box. Um, these are some photos from a sixth grade field trip to Camp Ketcha. They're working on their team building skills. As you can see, they look pretty fun. <laughs> and this is Minute to Win It challenges from the middle school. Middle school's new acronym is PRIDE, and it stands for Positivity, Responsibility, Integrity, Dedication, and Effort. So students won some prizes, as you can see in the, um, the picture on the left, and they competed in Minute to Win It challenge games. Um, so last night at Wentworth there was the open house and this was a chance for parents to see their students like classroom spaces and tour the school. They could stop by their art, music, band, STEM, phys ed, guidance, dare, world language classrooms and see the academic support rooms. They could also get um, nutrition services information and there were even Sundays for sale. Um, also they could see the playground and tour the garden where there were mums for sale. Um, here we go. Uh, so there's a new position through contracted services called the School Garden Assistant, which is being taken by Lisa Bennett. Um, Ms. Mrs. Bennett is an experienced teacher and has, a, has the most wonderful and inviting personality, which is a quote from Principal Mrs. Crosby. Uh, the goal of this um, uh, garden is to transform the beautiful space into an outdoor learning lab to ensure access for all students. And since she was hired, the use of the space has been like greatly increased, like astronomically. Um, oh wait, I skipped one. Oh, we're still on this one. Sorry. Um, it's being run with classroom teacher Mrs. Hewitt, and it teaches kids about botany, <coughs> life sciences, agriculture, and social studies and writing. And Mrs. Bennett ha has actually done a lesson on Westworld expansion and how that looked for like gardening, I, I don't really know. Uh, <laughs> um, so, as you can see, I took some pictures. In the upper left-hand corner, there's a sign that says blueberries on it. And um, Mrs. Vafiatis, who is the world language teacher there, has actually added, um, you can't saw it in the picture because this was taken, taken before this, but she has added the um, French and Spanish words for those. So this is actually a multi-classroom like classroom approach to teaching them about gardening. So. They're, they're going to be learning about the things and then they'll, it's like, it's trilingual. So, um, in the picture right below it, in the bottom left corner, you can see that they're making salsa with the things that they grew in the garden. So it's a, um, it's multidisciplinary and the kids made, um, they like learned how to do it, they followed a recipe and the kids actually like loved the salsa. Mrs. Bennett did not eat any of it, but, um, <laughs> They loved it. Um, and then the picture right next to it, the bottom middle one, the students from the special services room and other classrooms um, participated in making flower bouquets for teachers with flowers from the garden, and this was for random acts of kindness. And then um, the top right is their sensory portion of the garden, so they just have things that you can like smell, uh, touch, taste. It's really great for students to immerse themselves in the garden. And then. The bottom right-hand corner is their greenhouse with vegetables for their harvest. They have some other vegetables in the garden as well. And later, they're going to harvest those vegetables and have them at lunch. So that's going to be really cool. Um, in this picture, at Eight Corners School, they have new, um, this is students accessing learning tools with this flexible seating throughout their classroom. And this offers an opportunity for students to learn in a more comfortable way and it makes them focus more because you know they might be more antsy, so this might make them like more comfortable in their space. And then this last one is just pictures of some students from the first month of school at uh, Blue Point. And I heard from like a general consensus that the transition back into school was, went pretty well. I know for like the Wentworth and primary school kids, it can usually be kind of hard for them because they're younger and you know they love summer. So mm -hmm. it was. I heard it was a pretty smooth transition. So yeah, that's everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Moving into new business. Uh, 9.1. Motion to accept the meeting minutes of September 19th, 2019 as presented. So moved. Second. 
Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. All right. 9.2, second reading of policy JLAA, our wellness policy. Um, again, big thanks to the wellness committee for all the work that they did on this. Um, also policy for the many hours that we all put into getting this to a point of bringing it for a second reading. Um, I do want to draw your attention on page two. Based on our first reading, we had feedback on 2.2 um, regarding student rewards and incentives with food. So we have reworded that. Um, so 2.2 is now foods and beverages will not be used as individual student rewards or incentives without administrative approval. And 2.3 also came up in a question, so it has been reworded as fundraising groups are prohibited from selling food items during the day. Any discussion? Uh, move to approve as written. Can I, can I, oh, can we have discussion now? Somebody has a second. second yes. Oh, right, right, sorry, second. Now we can have discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just, so I know we had questions about the new food shaming bill and how that's addressed in our policy. And if you go to 4.0, nutrition promotion, 4.3, 4.4, and 4.5 address, I believe, the sentiments mm -hmm. of the food shaming bill. So I think we're, we're covered with this, and then I'm sure that there's like protocols and procedures that the nutrition program uses to ensure that the cashiers aren't talking to the kids about about the um, payments and such. So I think that we're covered with that. Right, that was one of the extensive training that the, yeah. the Department of Education came down in our all staff training, and they went over this the whole program prior to the continuing bill. So all of my staff and pretty much most of Southern Maine. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and we even we even mentioned um, that there won't be stigma as it relates to, um, to um, school nutrition. Um, we won't be asking about students' balances at at the cash register. Or excuse me, I should say that um, they will have an they will have access to a meal without. Yeah, Without conditional of that, yeah, here, right. Anyway, so so I, I think thank you. I think the concerns about that are are not needed. Okay, great. Any other discussion on this? Okay. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Ten point three or nine point three. Motion to grant approval of the long range planning committee to contact the selected members of the SPS Building Steering Committee and present the final list of names at the October 17th, 2019 school board meeting. So, so moved. Second. Okay. Discussion? So I just wanted to add a, a quick a quick point of clarification here. So that this kind of evolved pretty quickly, this motion. So I did want to just say for the public's benefit that our originally our plan was to go into executive session tonight and then come back and actually announce names. But after reflecting on it and talking about it together, we kind of decided that, wait a minute, we should probably reach out to these people once we choose them and make sure that they're actually still interested. Because <laughs> while some of them came last night, not all of them could. So we wanted to make sure that we solidified that list before we announced it so that anyone sitting at home didn't you know, spit their coffee on the TV or something like that because they were just nominated to a committee without really being asked permission. So um, we're going to do that outreach after tonight and make sure we can bring that list on the 17th, knowing that every single person on there will have said yes. Fantastic. All right. All those in favor? Again, unanimous. Um, which then brings us to 10.0, a motion to go into executive session pursuant to 1 MRSA 405-6A for the selection of the SPS Building Steering Committee members not to return to public session tonight. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Again, unanimous. Seven with two. Thank you very much. Thank you. Peter, thank you so much for coming. So